man, what is Paul doing? It has been 20 and a half chapters in the book of Acts, three different journeys of Paul going from town to town, from city to city, preaching the gospel. Lystra, Derby, Ephesus, Thessalonica, Philippi, Berea, Athens, Corinth, just to, just to name a few. And in each town, he starts by going to the temple where he presents the message of grace and freedom found in Jesus Christ. And also in each town, he has opposition, almost always from the Jews, saying that what he's teaching goes against the laws of the Old Testament. In some cases, he, he leaves the temple and he forms a new church, going to the Gentiles and telling them they also are loved by God. He preached that Jews and Gentiles were, were all welcome in God's kingdom. The gospel message is that you are free from the law, whether Jew or Gentile, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're male or female, whether you're free or slave, all are loved by God. And that Christ paid the atonement for your sins and and it is through grace that you've been saved, not by your own works. In fact, he says, you cannot live a life good enough to earn your way into heaven. And living by the Old Testament law, it cannot give you eternal freedom. But never once, never one time did Paul concede that the Jews were right and that adhering to the law was the way to salvation and eternal life. Never once does he say that. But man, it sure seems like that's what he's saying now. Because now, halfway through chapter 21, it really seems like he's turning his back on the, the last half of this book. The first 20 chapters, where he's been so diligently preaching grace and freedom. And now, at chapter 21, it's like he's his own self again, his, his, his old self. And he's going to start living under the restrictions of the law? Is that what's going on here? I mean, is that what's happening and as we jump into our story this morning, we've got a lot more questions than we have answers. And if you missed last week, you got to just stop right now and go back and, and just watch last week's message. Check it out on Facebook or on YouTube because last week we set up this question, what is Paul doing? As we talked about his arrival in Jerusalem. And this morning we're going to dig deeper into this story and we're going to get some answers. And just to quickly catch you up, I'm going to hit just a few verses from last week before we start a, a deeper dig. So if you have your Bibles with you, would you join me in Acts 21? We'll begin at verse 17. Acts 21, starting at verse 17. When we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters received us warmly. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, and all the elders were present. Paul greeted them and reported in detail, in detail, what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard this, they praised God. Then they said to Paul, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed and all of them are zealous for the law, the Old Testament. They've been informed that, Paul, you're teaching all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses and telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. What are we going to do? They will certainly hear that you've come. So do what we tell you. There are four men with us who have made a vow 
take these men, join in, become part of their purification rites, pay their expenses so, so they can have their heads shaved. And that way, everyone will know there's no truth in these reports about you. But you yourself are living in obedience to the law. Remember, this goes against everything Paul has been set out to, to preach about. This goes against everything that Paul has been trying to defeat. Now drop down for a second to verse 26. You would think Paul is going to say, uh, no way. And he doesn't. Verse 26, the next day Paul took them in and purified himself along with them. Then he went to the temple to give notice of the date when the days of purification would end and the offering would be made for each of them. Wait just a second. What's going on here? It's a seven-day ritual, a seven-day strict observance of the law, and Paul agrees to do this? Paul, you've told us over and over again, we no longer live under the law. We no longer need to observe those customs. We live under grace and mercy. You yourself said that Christ paid the sacrifice. Christ took the offering. Paul, we don't have to do that anymore. What are you doing? Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, the Old Testament's a beautiful thing. But these pages show us our weakness. There was a law to show us that on our own, we are we're broken. There was a law to show us that there is a holy God that we cannot reach no matter how good a life we try to live. But the entire Old Testament, it points to a Redeemer, a Savior that makes a way for us to come before a holy God. And Paul, you, you've spent the last 20 chapters going village by village and city by city saying you've got Christ all of this, it doesn't matter anymore. And now you're being a hypocrite? What's the deal? And as we jumped into this now, I, I love the way a Bible commentator, a man named Clark, a phenomenal Bible commentary, he wrote this about this particular situation. He says, Paul had already shown them that their ceremonies their law were useless, but not destructive. That they were only dangerous when they depended on them for their salvation. You see, Paul's made it clear throughout the book of Romans and then in the book of Galatia. He says, look, your Old Testament, it's useless when it comes to your salvation. It's not destructive. You can put yourself under the law if you want but it's not going to do you any good. What he consistently told them was you can't be saved by trying to be good enough. And, 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 and on top of that, beware of thinking because I observe the law, I'm somehow more spiritual than, than you are. He says beware of that elitism that says, oh, you don't do page 4, 9, 24, 39. You don't do those? Oh, I do. And so therefore, I'm, I'm more spiritual than you are. He said the law is a dangerous thing because it can puff you up spiritually, but it cannot give you salvation. It's not destructive. It had its purpose. So Paul's not really being a hypocrite, and I want you to see this. I want you to flip over in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and I want you to find verses 19 through 20. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 through 20. Paul says this. He says, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. Now remember, this is written long before Paul got to Jerusalem. This was written while Paul was still in Ephesus. And he's telling his church in Corinth, he says, let me explain to you my heart. When I have to face the, the difficult situations, when I have people out there pushing my buttons and trying to get me to say something, he says, let me tell you what I, what I think about. Let me tell you what runs through my mind. Though I am free, I belong to no one. 
Though I have freedom through knowing God and the grace of God and belonging to God, yet I make myself a slave to everyone. Why? To win as many as possible. Verse 20, he says, to the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. So as to win those under the law. Paul says, let me tell you about my love for people. Let me tell you about my love for Christ. Even though I've got freedom in Christ and grace, I'm going to become enslaved to the people around me. It means that I will serve you and I will love you in order to win you. And if that means going under the law, so be it. And it's not being a hypocrite, my friends. It's so much more than that. It's so much more than that. So yes, when I'm with the Jews, I'll go back under the law to win them. However, we're no longer bound by the Old Testament. And when I come back home and my home church starts throwing up in my face everything that I've been preaching that's different out there, I've got a decision to make. I can lock and load. North Idaho Paul comes out. I can force them to listen to me. I can, I can convince them. I can, I can make them see things my way. Or or I can love them. Church, believe me, Paul has the ammunition, the spiritual ammunition to blow everybody in that room out of the water. He has the stories. He has the work of the Spirit. He has the firsthand experience of going town by town by town and seeing changed communities. He's got the Old Testament knowledge. Remember, he grew up studying the Old Testament every single day. He was a Pharisee and a highly placed member of the Sanhedrin. But now he has a New Testament relationship with Christ. Oh, Paul can easily destroy this table on the issues of grace and freedom. Or he can shut up and shave his head and move into the temple and go under the law because he believes that's how I'm going to win him. And so the next day, Paul sets out to do just that. You see, Paul saw a huge problem in front of him, but it wasn't the problem that was in the church. It was a problem, but that was, well, that was tiny in comparison. The huge problem was that his people, the Jews, were dying and going to hell and believing and trusting in the Old Testament law to save them. So the little problem inside his church right now, that didn't push his buttons. You say, Bill, that wasn't a little problem. This was actually dividing a nation. Yes, it was. A nation was being split. But Paul saw eternity as being split. And with an eternal perspective, the things that he's being told to do, okay, I'll do it. It's no big deal. And the very next day, Paul went out and did everything that he knew was ludicrous. Everything that grace and mercy took him from, he suffered for a week in the temple courts and he put himself out in and inconvenience and sacrifice because Paul says, this is how I'm going to win them. And if it comes down to, to my dignity or winning somebody, oh, hands down every time, I'm going to win them. You see, we have to remember that when it came to ministry, the Jews were Paul's worst enemy, his own people. They harassed him. They persecuted him from town to town. They, they were stirring up lies. We've seen angry mobs chasing Paul all around the Aegean Sea on all of his journeys. Who made up those mobs? Jewish people. The Jews have been the ones that have caused him more harm, more beatings, and have turned him over to the Roman government over and over, time and time again. They're the ones who have come after Paul with all kinds of accusations that are false. And yet, 
he still loves them. He still loves them. And so if it means that he's going to get credibility by going under the law and he gets a chance to win them for Christ, he says, I'll do it. I'll do it. So let's look at Paul's decision making. And the first thing that we're going to see is looking through the lens of eternity. Man, everything else is just not as important. If we see life through the lens of eternity, the, 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 the problems that we see out there today, they're going to fall into place. If you fill your heart with the burden that people in your life, your friends, your coworkers may be spending eternity in hell, I promise you the, the problem of whether they voted Democrat or Republic isn't going to be a big deal to you anymore. Because you're, you're, you're going to be gripped by what matters. And so how do we do that? How do we see life through an eternal lens? Well, we can write it this way. Jesus is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Jesus is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. You cannot just call him a good figure. You cannot just call him a good person. You can't call him a great teacher or a wise man. He won't let that happen. He won't. 83 times he claims that he is the Son of God. And he's walking around Judea and he's walking through Jerusalem and he's surrounded with the Jewish culture. And what's the Jewish culture holding on to? This part back here, the Old Testament. What are they waiting for? Daniel chapter 7. One day the Son of Man will appear, God's Son, and He will come with power and might that every knee, every language, every tribe, every person will bow and know that He is God. 83 times Jesus says, I am that guy. Don't you get it? Jesus says over and over again, by me all men will be judged. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to heaven but through me. If you really read Jesus, and not just superficially, but if you really read and listen to Jesus' words, there's only two options. He's either Lord of all, or he's not Lord at all. And if he's not the Lord at all, he's a liar, or a lunatic, or, or a crazy guy. If he's not the Lord at all, he lied way too much for me to call him a good man, or a good teacher, or a holy person. If he's not the Lord at all, he was ludicrous because he kept saying over and over again, he was the only way by which all people will be saved. And if we, if we go through life every single day with an eternal perspective and realize, man, he's talking about every person, every neighbor, every friend, everyone in my circle. He wants to be their Lord. He wants to be their God. Republican, Democrat, young or old, rich or poor, white, black, brown, anything else, he wants to be their Lord. So when Paul sees this situation through the lens of eternity, he's like, okay, I'll do it. If it means that I can win him for Christ. Because when I understand what's important for eternity. I'm not going to get caught up in the problems of the day because there's so much more at stake here than Old Testament law. Eternity is at stake. Can I just take you back for one minute? Can I just take you back one chapter? Flip over, flip over to chapter 20, verse 24. It's Paul's last time talking to that church in Ephesus, and listen to what he says. Acts chapter 20, verse 24. He says, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. He says, look, it's not about my life. It's not about my comfort or my security. It's not about what I have or what I don't have. My aim, my only aim. Man, I want to complete the task God's given me. 
And that task is to give the good news of God's grace to all people. Guess what, church? It's not just Paul's task. It's our task, too. It's the task that God has given to all of us that call ourselves Christians. This is our task. Is it going to be easy? No, not always. Does it mean sometimes we might be uncomfortable? Absolutely. But church, I really, really need you to hear me on this. We have spent 52 weeks going through the book of Acts, and we probably have another two months left in it. Have you ever stopped and asked yourself why? Why have we gone verse by verse and chapter by chapter looking at how Paul handled conflicts 2,000 years ago? And I would answer simply by saying, look around you, church. Look what's going on. Look around you today. Do you see conflict? Do you see divisiveness? Do you see hatred? Do you see an out-of-control government that's dictating things that go completely against our Bible? We're entering into a time in our history where we may face very similar problems to what Paul had 2,000 years ago. And it's important that we know these stories, but it's far, far more important that we understand the principles behind these stories. We have to know how to handle the tough times and the opposition in our lives in order to win people for Christ. Oh, church, I can help you know the stories from the Word of God, or or I can teach you to apply them to our lives today. And I have to be honest with you, I have no interest in just simply teaching the Bible as stories. You can read it for yourself, just like I can. And if it's only knowledge of the Bible that you're after, I think you're missing out on the power of God and His living Word. Because when we get to heaven, it's not going to be How well do you know your Bible? When we get to heaven, there's not going to be an entrance exam saying, what's Paul's hometown? Uh, Antioch? (laughs) Back of the line. When we get to heaven, it's not going to be, what was the name of the prophet that came up to Paul and bound himself and said, this is going to be you when you get to Jerusalem? Let's see, was that Philip? (laughs) Back of the line, that was Agabus. It's not how much Bible you know. It's, is your heart and your head right with your Lord and Savior? And we use God's Word. We use the Bible as a guide on how to do Christian living. Because if we can understand what Paul did at, at that table in, that, in the face of that conflict, it's going to show us how do we do this in our life today? And so how do we do this? How do we face unimaginable opposition and criticism? How do we face people who hate everything that we stand for and believe in and still keep our eternal perspective? Well, let me just ask you, how did Paul do it? And the first thing we need to understand about Paul is that he never put making a point ahead of loving others. Now, understand what I mean here. I'm, I'm always going to try to make my point. I'm, I'm an outgoing guy. I'm a type A personality. There ain't nothing shy about this kid. I love a good debate, and I will always try to win an argument, but I also know when I'm trying to make my point, if in any way it comes across as unloving, it is time for me to shut up. Why? because I don't want to get caught up in the concerns going on around me when there's a much bigger issue at stake. Now, when I can make my point, and it's loving, and it's done with grace and with mercy, yeah, I will always try to make my point. But I have crossed the line when the point that I was trying to make came ahead of loving someone else. So Paul says, I've crossed the line when winning an argument comes before doing the task that God has set before me. I've crossed the line when winning an argument is more important to me than winning people. And so church, I'm going to ask you, what are you winning right now? Are you more concerned about making a point? Or can you look around and go, you know what? That person's closer to Christ. That person's closer to Christ. Those people over there, they don't know me yet. 
But when they read my post that I'm going to put on Facebook, they're going to see love that's uncommon today because it comes from Christ. Number two, never forget who you are winning is more important than what you are winning. This is an easy one to forget because if I, if I could just have a scoreboard that tells me who I'm winning and not what I'm winning, then I would have a filter. I would have a, a reminder that I can't just, I can't just give, put my, my opinion over their salvation. Oh, there's times I want to. There's times I want to make my point so bad, but, but, but I need to have a filter because I want to love them. And you say, Bill, who is them? I don't know. I don't know. It could, be, it could be the guy at the grocery store. It could be that waitress at the restaurant. It could be whoever's going to read my Facebook posting that I don't even know who they are. But if I can't say my point without being loving, and, and, and if I can't say my point and still not be offensive, then it's time for me not to say my point. Maybe it's not that important that I win an argument if it means I can't win that person. And number three, don't put politics ahead of your testimony. Don't put politics ahead of your testimony. Here's my problem, and, and, and for many of us, even Christians, and I got a, a great example. There's a church downtown, and you may know this church, a wonderful pastor, but he has embroiled himself into a political discussion that has many people now simply criticizing him because of what he stands for, because he's red instead of blue. He's put politics ahead of his faith and, and, and his testimony. My problem is we're far more compassionate, we're far, we're far more passionate, we're far more invigorated about our social situation and politics and our economy right now than we are in Christ. We pay more attention to the, to the six o'clock news than we do to our Bibles. And, and that passion, it can easily get in the way of being a faithful representative of Jesus. I know the enemy is winning when my frustration, when my angst, when my anger robs me of the fruit of the Spirit. I know the enemy is winning when my frustrations with society or politics or government or civil rights or my economy or, or even my marriage, when my frustrations with any of that steals my fruits of the Spirit, the enemy is winning. What's the fruit of the Spirit? Most of you already know it. Galatians 5, I put it there in your handout. But let me ask you a question right now. How many Christians do you know that are walking in love joy and peace and patience and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control and self-control and what's the last one self-control and i'd add to that list self-control can you look at this list and go yeah this is the way i respond in almost everything i say and do Yo, wait a minute, somebody called me a right-wing extremist. Someone said I was a flaming liberal. Someone called me a racist. Someone said I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a hater of gays and lesbians. Someone said I'm being intolerant because I think abortion is wrong. And my response back to them? Did they see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? Or was I just trying to win the argument and make my point? Paul sits at this table and he says, I'm grieved not at how you handled the situation about who God is and what he's been doing throughout my, my journeys, not about how you've, you've understood how God's moving in our community, I'm grieved that there are so many people that don't still know Christ. And I will go under the law, even though I'm not under it. Because I love those people. I will do what my enemies expect, and I will walk with them, and I may win some of them. 
But the truth is, I didn't make up my mind here at this table today. I wrote it down for you. It was a letter that I was wrote two journeys ago from Ephesus. Church, far too many of us are losing our aim of whose we are and what we're supposed to be about because we live in a culture that is super saturated right now with everything we read and everything we click and everything we watch. Yes, we have huge issues in our lives right now. And we need to be a part of and a voice into those issues, but never, ever at the cost of the greater issue that we are called to win people for eternity. That's how Paul was used by God 2,000 years ago. And that's how we are going to be used by God today. Let's pray. Oh, Father, may we be a people that are clear on our calling. May we never forget as we walk through these days whose we are. May we never forget that you have never called us to win arguments. You've called us to show love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Oh God, I pray that the, the population of heaven will be forever changed because we remember that loving people is so much more important than making a point. And we pray this in your son's precious name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and bring you peace. Thank you for joining us this morning. Please come back next Sunday. But in the meantime, man, there's so many people out there right now that are hurting and they need some joy. They need some hope. They need a reason to believe. Pray for them. Pray with them. Give them the hope that they're looking for. It's right here. And then invite them to come to church with you next Sunday. God bless you.